thank you for that very clear presentation of uh, the issues at hand and reminding us effectively that there are uh, macro issues when it comes to transport, big scale, metropolitan wide, as we've heard in the first two presentations, and actually some micro issues in terms of intervention, which are very, very important because that's very at the heart of our inquiry. What can you do in the physical shape of the city which makes um, a difference? I'm always reminded, Gita, I think I'm right, that um, the number of deaths uh, which don't cause shock or horror when you see that figure of 160,000 a year comes into focus when you say it's more than one jumbo, jumbo jet crashing every day. That's, that's the sort of way to think. Think of that in terms of the, the headlines. And I'm stealing it from you as a story. I'm not inventing it myself. Um, we now have time uh, before coffee for um, discussion. Uh, and uh, what I really would like to do is since after this session we really are moving back into the health and well-being discussion and talking to people who are specialists in health, uh, in diseases, and in uh, how do you actually deal with uh, uh, not just the planning side but the provision side, I'd like to as much as possible connect what we've been saying in terms of transport equity and uh, social inequality with speculations about what that means in terms of the, the health issue rather than just keep it within um, the um, mobility context. I mean, that's in the spirit of sort of interdisciplinary discussion. If you're to talk about that, then yes, you exactly. Uh, yes, it, from what I know in Europe, or at, yes, or at least in France, uh, many of those um, lethal accidents in cities are also caused by people who were under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Have you been able to establish uh, any linkage? That kind of detailed data is not available. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Roger Chen from the University of Hong Kong. Uh, thank you very much, you know, for this very exciting program. You know, we learned a lot in the last two days. Uh, a broader question is related to the urban age pro projects. It's uh, very much uh, city focus. I would perhaps, you know, like to take the liberty to uh, inquire the relations between cities and its hinterland. And in this particular comment, I, I probably would like to follow up uh, from uh, Jimmy's presentations in the case of Hong Kong, knowing very well that Hong Kong will not and cannot survive without fresh water supply, food supply, you know, from the hinterland. And as such, you know, in the context of a healthy city, I think this is also very important and part and partial of the success of any cities that we can contemplate and argue. Um, if I may just uh, invite Jimmy to sort of uh, take us through the possible integration, you know, beyond economic integration of Hong Kong, in particular after 1997, that how Hong Kong can fare itself as one of the leading metropolis, you know, uh, in the light of the in integrations, you know, with Shenzhen and beyond uh, within the Pearl River Delta area. Thank you. Okay, if I may. Um, uh, very briefly, I just give you a start off with some figures. At the moment, crossing between Hong Kong and Kowloon is about one and a half million people each day. Crossing the boundary between Hong Kong and Zhenzhen, our city in, in the mainland, is about half a million every day. So as far as government is concerned, one of our major initiatives under the Hong Kong 2030 study is to enhance the linkage with the mainland. This we, buy, we, we do by uh, investing in infrastructure. We are now building the uh, bridge, a road bridge to linking up with Macau and Zhuhai uh, on the west side of Hong Kong. This is, if you like, the missing link at the moment. Uh, all the links are with the north. Uh, we are now also building the high-speed railway with the terminus uh, at the West Kowloon, uh, near the West Kowloon Cultural District. Uh, it would take you 15 minutes to go to Fu Tian, the CBD in Shenzhen. So we are doing a lot of work in terms of infrastructure. Right. We also have regional cooperation with governments in Guangdong, Macau, and the city at city levels. Yes, I think you know the, the question here, without necessarily answering it directly, is yes, it's good to connect, but who is one connecting? I mean, I think that's that's important. It's like the question perhaps yesterday, which is. Um, 
a development that's good, but good for whom? And I, I think what came out from some of the presentations today is the, uh, uh, so clearly we understand there are vulnerable communities of very, very different sorts in all, in all our cities. And uh, access to transport can either help or make worse uh, those, those conditions. And I think that's something hanging in the air that we may want to go back to. And Philip, I might ask you to comment on that. But Dieter Lappen? Yes, I like very much the presentation. Especially, I would like to make some comments or this exchange ideas with Philip. So, linking the question of equity to accessibility, I think it's extremely important. And uh, but maybe we have to really. I would I would uh, make a radical hypothesis that the success of of of, of Mombe is the, the result of not planning. I think we, we have really to, to link this question of, uh, of this transport equity in, the, in, the, in comparison to the important impact of informal settlement in informal economies. And when we look at Mambi, so we see that in the middle of Mambi, we have the biggest slums. Darabi with about one million just in the middle of two railway tracks. And uh, when, we, when we compare it with Sao Paulo, oh, and what's also important that with the breaking down of the textile mills, the people created their own microeconomy. So you have extremely integration of living and working in this, in this informal economy. In Sao Paulo, the, the favelas have been pushed out and they are more linked to the formal economy. They followed with a, with a, with a manufacturing suburbanization out of Sao Paulo and, uh, and with, a, with a de industrialization they cut off from, from their, their opportunities to jobs. So you have a double uh, problem of equity. In Istanbul, with the Getsche contours, you still have this uh, relatively mixed structure in the middle of the city, but as we have seen, the Getsche contours are more and more pushed out and torn down and replaced by gated communities. So this, this, uh, this middle position of Istanbul might be an intermediary position. And uh, the problem what we are facing is that evidently, and that was also the position of, 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 uh, of what we have seen of, of Kitam, that as soon as transport planning starts, the, the, the mobility, I would call it mobility equity, not transport equity, and accessibility equity declines. Right. And this is actually is a very, very serious problem for our profession, yeah. that, that the better results are the result of not planning. And as soon as we start planning, well, we reinforce the, the, I, I, the inequality. Think, uh, Philip, do you want to comment? I mean, Mumbai, you can't really say it's not planned. Um, it was planned by 19th century, early 20th century British transport engineers with two railway systems. But not, yeah. Philip. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that conclusion partially uh, is very tempting, but I, I, I would also be slightly more, more careful in parts because I believe in planning, but um, the, 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 I think what the problem here is, and you're, you're absolutely right that what we're seeing in Mumbai and what we're seeing in Istanbul, unfortunately, is probably a pattern which is now radically changing and uh, will probably not be sustained if developments continue as uh, business as usual. And, and in that sense, um, the already sort of, so to speak, higher developed uh, Sao Paulo metropolitan region is sort of uh, the model, the tendency is going towards, un very unfortunately. Now, the problem is that the current informal settlements, and even in the case of Istanbul, um, where I said sort of the consolidated informal uh, settlements seem to be a good model, um, are, are unable to bring us to the, to the sort of degree of formalization which is required when it comes to the, the core structure of the city, the, the, the quality of the housing that sustains in the case of Istanbul an earthquake and in the case of, of Mumbai that provides at least a minimum level uh, of services in the long run. Uh, so I think that, that upgrading process uh, is the one which we need to uh, detach from a process of peripheralization. Uh, and I think that, in, a, in many ways, is, is uh, sort of the, the key to uh, a more integrated success story. So, I mean, it really does mean in favor of planning, uh, but planning with a sort of understanding of the, these impacts at, at 
the very diverse social levels of different groups, I mean, as opposed to being generic. Often we just talk about big macro issues in terms of resolving the problem while it's much more subtle than that. Gita, I'm on this point, and then three more questions. Very quick intervention for Mumbai. See, the other interesting part in many Indian cities, including Mumbai, is because of our electoral democracy. Because originally they start as an informal settlement, illegal settlement, but when the election time comes, most of these people are regularized. <coughs> so they become, they become part of the, they somewhat become part of the formal system. It's not that easy to shun them out of the city. Atha Hussain? Just a question about, and there is a rush by a number of Indian cities to develop underground transit system, much like the cities in China. Is that emphasis misplaced in terms of solving traffic problems and fatalities problems? Absolutely. I think so because uh, most of this rush is coming as we understand. And our group has been doing a lot of documentation on that. It is mostly for uh, investment purposes. It is not really to solve public transport problem. In fact, with this, I would also like to point out, because since this morning we heard twice that Hong Kong 89% is public transport, but your own document here is showing 44% people in Hong Kong are walking to work, and within public transport, bus is 30%, and train is, uh, metro is only 13%. So many times it's a perception what is dominating. And this is what is happening in Indian cities in Delhi. After having, uh, now we have about nearly 200 kilometers of underground. It carries only less than 4% of the total trips. I have four very brief statements, rather, and then we will wind up. Mithanwi Taylor, who's led all our research here. Um, hello. I have a, a quick question for Mr. Lung. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on a couple of the points that you emphasized early on in your presentation regarding your overall objectives, which I think one was around convenience and another was around diversity and vibrancy. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about some of the trade-offs between those, because um, that was something that came up in the research that we did with Professor Yip at Hong Kong University. Um, the, the two specific examples that you mentioned uh, were pedestrian walkways around Central and also the, the redevelopment of the harbour front on both sides of uh, Victoria Harbour. So I guess I wanted to ask you in relation to those two specific cases, what you see those trade-offs are um, and what the possibilities for, for developing things differently might be. Thank you. Jimmy, if you make a note of those questions, we're going to come back at the end. Rick? Yes, Rick Rubens from uh, I, I just want to, with an eye toward the specific health issues that we're going to be talking about later, I, I think it's very important that we consider the kind of planning that we're discussing, whether planning is good or bad. The, there's a role for public realm planning that, that is very important in community building and the kind of issues that Richard was talking about. The, the success of, 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 the, of places like Dharavi in, in, in Mumbai have to do with the fact that there's an intense sense of community and a sense of personal interaction with other people. And certain kinds of public transportation planning, public space, public realm planning that creates the kind of parks and, and places for interaction actually is essential to the creation of the kind of well-being that has a, a effect on physical health through mental health. Is there a question? There's a question that these are, this sort of thing is something that I'm hoping that we talk very directly about in our future. Okay. Jorgen? Uh, Jorgen Eskemus in Denmark. Uh, in the discussion on, on transport, I very much the bicycle. Where's the bicycle? I mean, previously, Asian cities, major, the bicycle played a major role. In some European cities, the bicycle uh, is, has been on, uh, on the reduced, but is now coming back. In my own country, Denmark, Copenhagen, 37% of daily working trips are made by bicycle. I think we all do agree that the bicycle, in terms of health, is very good. In terms of, of environment, it's very good. But in, in it, it appears to me planners do not ride bicycles. I mean, uh, I Jim, miss it. Jimmy, do you ride a bike? Do you ride a bike? It's a bit steep here. I guess. Uh, uh, but, uh. 
Um, uh, congratulations for being re-elected to LegCo. No, as a district councillor, you're one of oh, the... Oh, well, uh, nearly, sorry. But in, in the district uh, council, that has a lot of transport issues. Right. Uh, but um, so it's interesting to know that those who are wealthy in Hong Kong have probably less access to public transport than those who are not health, uh, wealthy in Hong Kong. Um, but I'd like to point out two things that uh, of comments that were made earlier. One is uh, walking in Hong Kong is primarily to get to public transport. And when the, looking at the number of walking trips, it's usually during the day from uh, one business appointment to another business appointment. So the numbers there may not give you the, the, uh, the reality. Um, equity is great in Hong Kong. Everybody has access to public transport in Hong Kong. But now there is an issue. Um, we are currently building smaller flats. And, and, and you've heard that we have very small living spaces in Hong Kong. We're building even smaller flats at the, at the spaces where we like people to live, be, to provide equity in, in central spaces above railway stations. So we're building smaller and smaller flats to make sure that those spaces are affordable. So uh, is it improving equity or is it not improving equity? We're creating, we, we making it worse in Hong Kong, the amount of living space that's available to allow people who can't afford living in central to live in central or to live above a railway station. So we, and I think as, a, as, a, as, a, as you think about these issues, um, think about this problem that is occurring well, th th in Hong This Kong. is where our research, which HKU, Paul Yip, will be commenting on this uh, no doubt later, uh, did come up against the term which for us outsiders was uh, difficult to understand of convenience. And Jimmy has used this, David has used this, yeah. Carrie, Dr. Chow, the notion of convenience in a way respond, is a response to your question in, in, in terms of smaller space, the trade-off is but to be 10 minutes away or, uh, and that, that, that seems to be a cultural choice and issues that dimension we haven't talked about a lot. Now, we're about to wind up. I mean, I think we should take another five minutes. We'll cut into your coffee time, that's okay. Um, Philip, on this point. Jimmy, I'm yeah. coming back to you in a second. I, I, I think what our research indirectly suggests, and I'm pretty sure that the space standards in Sao Paulo are far superior to the other two uh, cities, uh, but uh, sure. with the enormous problems that are generated by people being virtually excluded from the labor market, almost go as far as suggesting that uh, the compromise in personal living space is maybe the better compromise compared to the one in metropolitan accessibility. Now, I'm not sure how that translates to the specific question of equity in the case of Hong Kong. Uh, but I do think that the poor in Mumbai, um, while being still integrated in the urban fabric, have long-term a better perspective of development than those that have been peripheralized in places like Sao Paulo, but having greater space standards. Paul, did you want to comment on Paul Yip, on Paul Zimmerman's point about I, th I think in Hong Kong, I think the people are very pragmatic. I mean, they, they, they do like to have the convenience. And sometimes because of the pressure of work and then all those sort of things, they are willing to sacrifice their comfortability because of the convenience. I think what they are talking about, they are willing to stay in this so-called so split flat, within the flat, which the total living area is only about 100 square feet. But because the long working hours in Hong Kong, and actually they say that there's no point I have a 600 square feet when I, when, when I go home, and then it is dark already, I won't be able to see, go to see the balcony, and then you have no view anyway. So, so because of long working hours, and that is the deal, that is the compromise. I think the Hong Kong people are willing to make, to make the compromise, but what my question is, how far can we go? I think there must be a certain limit, there must be a certain threshold, that I think we are going to break. I think if we are not going to mitigate this sort of living space, uh, uh, the problem in Hong Kong. Jimmy, if you could address this question and the family's detailed okay. question. But before I do that, I want to, uh, you, the, the things that you mentioned about transport and equity, I don't want to leave it in the balance. I want to address the issue, if, you, if I may. Uh, although, admittedly, my department has done, not done any research specifically on that, but every two years, we did survey on the cross-boundary uh, movement. So from our survey, if I remember correctly, uh, a lot of people are just uh, of the not high income group are going to China to work. Some are coming back to work here. Uh, about 10,000 students are now crossing the, harbor, uh, the, the boundary from Shenzhen to Hong Kong for schools. 
every day. So uh, a lot of people, better off people, go off for a weekend for golf uh, in the mainland. So I would say that from my uh, impression, is the infrastructure planned by us are being used by all walks of life. But I can come back, you know, maybe next time to address, address that question. The two to provide. specific points? Yeah, the, on the specific point, I, I don't quite get uh, my Fanny's uh, point, if I, rem I uh, understand it correctly. The pet walkway provide all weather condition, and also the uh, promenade will be for all people. It's very close to the where our concentration of uh, population, the, the harbor area. So it's, it's going to uh, very easily accessible. And, and Mifanri, what's your concern? concern. What, um, what was worrying uh, you? With the pedestrian walkway, I guess it's slightly connecting with some of the things that Professor Sennett raised earlier and that have been, I think, even raised by the secretary as well around street life. Um, so you're, you're elevating the street and it's being provided often by a private developer. So that was the question in relation to the pedestrian walkway. I think it's slightly different in relation to the harbour front, and I didn't explain this very well, but it's quite striking on this side, I think, of the harbour that um, uh, it's very much dominated by what I would see as a sort of urban highway and also by bus depot and ferry terminus, quite separated from the more walkable areas. So I guess it's about how you're going to manage to open up a walkable waterfront with all that infrastructure that functions very well in terms of convenience, but maybe not in terms yeah, of Yeah, very quickly, diversity. the last question first. Uh, it's going to be difficult, but we are trying to remove all these, if you like, barriers from the waterfront promenade to enhance the accessibility. I think for us, coming from outside, we have to abandon the notion of street level. Uh, not really. There's, I, you know, there are 10 street levels in Hong I, Kong. I don't, no I don't totally no, agree with... with wait, Jay, we have... I'll well, come to you, Tony. Uh, in Central, the pedestrian flow is so intense that yeah. I'm sure that we can have uh, both level. Well, you do. We, we still have vibrant streets, so yeah. that's not a problem for us. Jason, general point? Yeah, general point. I, I, I'm worried a little bit that our conversation has moved uh, as a planner who works mostly in public health to a very fragmented, very planning, design-oriented yeah. discussion and away from what we've learned in decades in public health of more of an integrated relational perspective. So moving away from just transport, just land use, just design, just physical activity, to what are the characteristics of places and communities and cities that make people more healthy. Uh, and to continue to perpetuate the kind of research and conversation that's fragmented, uh, I think is only going to, you know, not really lead to kind of the more interesting relational idea of place, of social, physical, economic, meaning making, the kinds of things that we were talking about uh, in part yesterday uh, in all parts of the world that kind of make places healthy. And I wonder to what extent this, the transport research that we heard about or the opportunities around the Olympics um, are kind of thinking in this relational way about how do we connect the dots as opposed to take the pieces apart. Yeah, well, I mean, I think we are going to use that big question you've raised as a way to frame some of the next sessions that we're going to have. I mean, I think in uh, presenting and Andy's case of the way the Olympics has been looked at as a piece of physical planning, it does join the dots. It does actually attempt to do some of the things about centered on placemaking, understanding vulnerability of different communities. And I think that Philip's work uh, in, in making the connection between excluded communities and transport systems is very much trying to get out of the box. So, Sometimes conversations do revert to type. I understand that, and you're right to remind us. I'm going to end the session here. I want to thank uh, Geetam, Jimmy, and uh, Philip for their excellent presentations. Uh, and could you please be back here in 22 minutes? Thank you very much. <laughs>